Een van de belangrijkste bijdragen aan de dialoog tussen geloof en wetenschap is afkomstig van John Polkinghorne. Deze professor in de fysica aan de Universiteit van Cambridge gaf zijn job op om Anglicaans priester te worden in het zuiden van Engeland. Tien jaar later werd hij gevraagd om terug te keren naar Cambridge als president van het prestigieuze Queen's College. En zeven jaar woonde hij in het gebouw achter mij, de President's Lodge. Het leven in een college is typisch voor de universiteiten van Oxford en Cambridge. Well, here we are. This is Cloister Court for the obvious reason that we're in a cloister in Queen's College. And the colleges are a very special feature of Oxford and Cambridge. They produce small academic villages within the big university really. Each college does every subject, has students studying every subject, has fellows, dons as we call them, who will teach all the different subjects. And the students live in college and they eat in college, so it's the center of their life. And they receive their sort of informal teaching, what we call supervisions, one to two type of teaching in their college. And in fact the colleges choose the students you have to become a member of a college before you can be a member of the university. So the colleges have a very important role, but the university is the sort of umbrella and gives the degrees and sets the exams and has things like laboratories and, and big lectures. So there's a sort of sharing of responsibility between the university and the colleges. And it, it makes for a very nice community. Quite oh, a beautiful room. Yes, this is the old combination room in Queen's mm. College. Combination room is a peculiarly Cambridge word. It means where you combine, where you get together. And Queen's College was founded in 1448 by mm. Queen Margaret of Anjou. And this uh, is the oldest part of the college and would have been completed by about 1450. So it's been around for really quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Is there a portrait of her? We don't have a po portrait of Margaret because nobody has one. Mm -hmm. But we do have a portrait of Elizabeth Woodville, our second foundress, over the fireplace there. She was the wife of Edward IV, who displaced Henry VI from the uh, throne of England during the War of the Wars of the Roses. So we backed both sides mm -hmm. in that conflict. So you have got women foundresses. We have women foundresses, and the college was founded to the honour of the female sex. Well, uh, nice to I'm, hear. I'm afraid we didn't have women students until uh, <laughs> about sometime in the 1970s. Mm. So it mm. took a long time for women to get their rightful place yeah. in the college. But they're very much here now and very much part of the life of the college. Yeah. Isn't that Erasmus? That's Erasmus over From, there, yes. He, yes was probably, I recognize him. he was probably the most famous person to have been in Queen's. He came to the college several times, but spent two and a half years here uh, teaching Greek and teaching theology in the university. He was a great friend of John Fisher, who was one of my predecessors as president of Queen's, and who got Erasmus to come and to bring the new learning to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. But he didn't stay. He didn't stay very long. He thought that the wind in Cambridge was cold, which <laughs> it is when it blows from the east, that the beer was rather thin, <laughs> and so he went back to the continent. Yeah. Newton was in uh, Cambridge, Paul Dirac was here. Uh, That's right. That's a very interesting surrounding. Uh, Cambridge has had a very big influence on the, the history of physics. The two people you mentioned, also Clark Maxwell, who oh, founded yeah. electromagnetic mm -hmm. theory. Uh, so that, uh, yes, Cambridge has been a very active place in, in physical science and remains so, of course, today. Mm -hmm. What college did you start when you were I started in Trinity, actually, and I was in Trinity a very long time. All my scientific career, I was a fellow of Trinity, as we call it. That's a don, uh, a senior member of the college. And I expected to die if I had to do it, but, but um, circumstances changed, I got ordained and I came back to Cambridge yes. and eventually became the president of this college, which I'm very happy to, to have been and very happy to be here now. But they were ancient, uh, they are ancient uh, rivals, they're not. Oh, that's right, that's right, they are, yes. Uh, but you have, to, you have to acquire a new set of ancestors when you, when you change colleges, a new set, new set of loyalties. Yes. Yes. So, when, when, you know, we have these boat races between the colleges on the river. Uh, so I who do you support then? Well, <laughs> Externally, of course, I support Queen's, but there is a little sort of internal gut feeling that First and Third Trinity, as their boat club is called, I wouldn't be sorry to see them doing quite well as well. <laughs> Subversive. Well, that's right. Well, you have to, you have to live a double life. I'm yeah, afraid. yeah. Well, um, Professor Bolkin, we brought something from Flanders, something historical from Flanders, because oh, it's not wonderful. all Cambridge who has the history. Absolutely. So. Well, that's wonderful. Here that's you are. lovely. I shall enjoy that. My wife will enjoy it too. Wonderful. Yes, these beautiful pictures. Yeah.
Flemish miniatures. Yes, I, I should enjoy that very much. That's very okay. good. Actually. Thank you very much well, indeed. I'm uh, looking forward to asking you some questions about uh, science and religion. That's well, I look we... forward to our conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maar is het wereldbeeld van de wetenschappen wel in overeenstemming met dat van de religie? Professor Paul Kinghorn, could you at the beginning of this program state one or two relevant elements of your worldview? Well, I want to take science very seriously and what it tells us about the world. I think that's, that's important. But it gets its success from only asking a limited number of questions. So I also want to take religion very seriously, because I think that is asking a different set of questions, and I need to put the two together. And I think if I look through my scientific eye and my religious mm -hmm. eye, I shall see more than I will with either of them on its own. So I want mm -hmm. to live an integrated life, taking seriously both science and religion. Do we need a world view? I think we do. I think it's a very natural human desire to understand the world, to make sense of it. And it's a very remarkable thing, I think, that we can make sense of the world. It, it is a, a cosmos, it is an, something that has an order and a purpose to it, and not a chaos, mm -hmm. not just one thing after another. So I think it's very natural to look for that, and I certainly very much want to do that. Who were you influenced by? Well, I was very much influenced, obviously, by the people who taught me. I, I, as an undergraduate, I was taught by Paul Dirac, who was one of the great founding figures of quantum theory a man of great intellectual power and austerity, a sort of scientific saint, really. He was never concerned with things like reputation, but he was very much concerned with the search for mathematical beauty as the key to understanding the world. And I did my PhD under a Pakistani physicist, actually, Abdus Salam, who won a Nobel Prize for physics, and who, again, was uh, full of enthusiasm and, 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 and a great producer of new ideas. Can you describe this field you were working in, this, this quantum world? Well, I was working on the elementary particle physics end of that. So, as so I say, I was trying to use mathematics to understand mm -hmm. the behavior of the smallest bits of matter. And I worked in the subject for about 25 to 30 years, a very interesting period as it turned out. When I started as a graduate student, we thought that matter was made up of protons and neutrons. And during that period, we discovered the protons and neutrons are themselves made out of yet more fundamental constituents, which mm -hmm. are the quarks and the particles that make them stick together, which I'm afraid are called gluons. So mm -hmm. I was part, in a small part, of that, that great sort of period of discovery. And it was a very exciting and interesting time to be in the, in the subject. Mm. Can you make clear what it is precisely? Um, because, well, our viewers, myself, we don't know that, l that much about science. Can you give some examples of what is the quantum world involved in? Well, the quantum world is, is very different from the, the everyday world. The everyday world is, is clear and regular. If you, you know where things are, you can see how you expect them to behave. Mm -hmm. The quantum world turns out, and this is a very great surprise, the quantum world turns out to be cloudy and fitful in its behavior. If you know where something is, you don't know what it's doing. If you know what it's doing, you don't know where it is. That's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It's also fitful in its behavior. We can't say the electron will definitely do this, we can say it might do this, it might do that, and we can calculate the probabilities, but we can't mm -hmm. say which it's going to do. So it, you have to, if you work in that world, you have to acquire a, a different way of thinking. And that was what I really got from Paul Dirac, who was the, the pioneer mm -hmm. of producing the right way of thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there is no, um, that you cannot pr predict things anymore? Well, you can't predict things with exactness. You can say, it doesn't mean that anything can happen. Mm -hmm. It may mean that only a certain range of things can happen, and this one is much more probable than that one. So you, you, there's, it's not completely without order, but it's not tightly determined. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, impact on, on your world view? I mean, when there seems to be another quantum world, which is totally mm -hmm. different from the everyday world, how do you connect the two? Well, I suppose the most important general lesson is that the world is surprising, that you can't guess beforehand what it's going to be like. You can't say, I know how things behave in the everyday world, therefore everything is going to be the same. You have to allow reality to, to tell you what it's like, to meet reality on its own terms. I think that's true of the, of the subatomic world of quantum theory. I also think it's true of the religious world, our encounter with God. I mean, God, 
may be surprising to us in all sorts of unexpected ways mm -hmm. that don't fit in with our everyday thinking. But we have to, what we're looking for is something that corresponds to the way things actually are. Does this, this quantum world contradict uh, our way of thinking about science? We had acquired a scientific way of thinking that we could predict things, that everything was fixed. Well, it certainly, it certainly destroyed a merely mechanical view of science, yes. as if the world was a great piece of clockwork, mm -hmm. which is really what things had seemed to be for a really couple of hundred years following Newton. But we now know the world is something more subtle and I believe more subtle than that. It is more interesting, in fact, than a piece of clock clockwork. And it is open to its future, for example, that it isn't just uh, everything ticking away with nothing new happening. There is enough room for manoeuvre in the world mm -hmm. for genuine novelty to, to emerge. Doesn't that mean that we have to change a paradigm, a way of thinking, a worldview? You have to change. You have to be open to, to a more profound sort of truth or a different type of truth. You don't lose the old truth. It isn't that when the Heisenberg mm -hmm. comes along you throw Newton away. Newton works very well for all sorts of things. And so part of the struggle and part of the interest is to see how you fit those two together. How on the everyday scale of things Newton is still a pretty good guide. Mm -hmm. You can use Newton to send a, uh, uh, an explorer vehicle to Mars for example. But how on the subatomic world it's different and how those two fit together. We only partly understand that actually. It's a very deep problem and a difficult problem. But that's what you have to do. It isn't that you take one and throw away the other, you have to enlarge your mm -hmm. thinking to include both. Another example, you write about the Bell theorem yes. uh, and about reductionism. Right. Could you expand on that? Well, that's, this is a very uh, surprising discovery. We found that in the quantum world, once two entities have interacted with each other, then they somehow or other remain entangled with each other, however far they may separate. What, well, what entities, for example? Well, let's say, let's say two photons, two particles of light. One of them stays here, the other one goes far away, beyond the moon, we conventionally say. If I do something to the one that's here, I measure it in some way, that has an immediate effect on the one behind the moon. It changes what's happening beyond the moon. So the two, in some sense, though they're far apart in space, are not totally separated from each other. They are, so to speak, influencing each other in this strange and unexpected way. Einstein was the f first person who spotted that might be so, and he thought it was so strange, so mm. spooky, he called it. He thought it must show there was something wrong with quantum theory. But we found from, from very beautiful experiments done in Paris that that's the way the world does actually behave. What? So, that the, so you see, even the subatomic world can't be treated atomistically as a bit here and a bit there. It's somehow tied together. You can't cut up things. things you can't cut up things, that's right. The, the nature fights back against a reductionism which says everything is just bits and pieces. But it turns out this bit and this piece are intimately connected with each other. Mm -hmm. So material can't be cut up in bits of pieces. There, there seem to be relations. There is, there is a deep-seated web of relationship in the world. And mm -hmm. that's something that we are only really beginning to explore. And it undoubtedly has very important uh, consequences for our view of what the world's like. For instance? Well, we should take, we should take relationality very seriously. You could say that the, the physics of the 20th century, both through quantum theory and the way we've been talking about, and through relativity theory in a somewhat different way, ties the world together. The old picture, which was you had a lot of atoms rattling around in an empty space, all doing their own thing, that, that picture is absolutely dead. And something much more interesting and much more connected than that is the way to think about became a parson. Didn't you experience a kind of intellectual gap? Yes, I did, of course. I mean, it was a change in my life. And, and um, yes, I missed two things, really. Uh, obviously, I missed the, the, the intellectual life. Um, I, I was an assistant priest in a working class parish in Bristol, then a vicar of a, a country parish in Kent. Very nice people, very nice congregations, but not, of course, academic 
uh, sort of settings. So that side of me wasn't very much exercised. Other sides of me was more exercised in terms of being with people in, in, in often in significant times in, in their lives. So I missed all that. And I also missed working with colleagues. The life of a priest is a fairly lonely life in some sense. You're meeting people all the time, but you don't have colleagues in the same sense you do in a research group. So life was different. And after doing it for a few years, I came to the conclusion that part of my vocation was to think and write about how science and religion relate to each other. I hadn't thought that when I first got mm -hmm. ordained, but I, I came to realize that. So when I got an unsought invitation to return to Cambridge, uh, I did that because it's easier, obviously, to do that sort of thinking and writing in an academic setting than it is in a parish setting. Mm -hmm. And I've been back here ever since. Mm -hmm. Professor Polkinghorne, you are well known for having taken natural theology right. back to the forefront. Now, what is natural theology? Well, natural theology is the attempt to learn something about God from just looking at the world and thinking about the world. Not based on particular religious experience, the prophets or Jesus Christ or whatever it may be, but just looking at general experience. And that's a limited sort of inquiry, but I think it's a, it's a, 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 a possible and indeed successful inquiry. And for example, I'll give you two examples. One is, why is science possible at all? Why can we understand the world? Well, obviously we've got to understand the everyday world. We couldn't figure out if you step off the top of a high cliff, you're going to be mm. in trouble, we wouldn't stay around for very long. But that doesn't mean that Isaac Newton can come along and see the, the same force that makes the cliff dangerous is the force that holds the moon in its orbit around the Earth, mm. and the Earth in its orbit around the Sun. We know lots of things that are far beyond everyday necessity. Why is the world so deeply understandable? Why is mathematics, beautiful mathematics as it turns out, the key to unlocking its secrets? That's something that science doesn't explain. It just exploits it. But it's something that's very striking about the world. And I would say that the world is understandable because we, it is a creation, because God's mind is behind its order, and we are creatures made in the image of our Creator. We have minds that can fit into that. So a religious belief will explain why science is possible. And then there's a second question, which is, why is the world so special? Now, that's a question that scientists really don't like. We don't like things to be special. We like things to be general. Mm -hmm. Our scientific inclination is to think, mm -hmm. we live in a universe which is a common or garden, any old, sort of more or less any old mm -hmm. universe, really nothing special about it. But the more we've understood the processes of the world, the more we've understood we live in a world that's very special indeed, very finely tuned, one might say, to allow life to happen. In other words, though life, of course, has come about through an e evolving process, it's necessary that evolution has taken place in a very precise setting of physical laws. If the laws of nature were different, even in small ways from what they are, carbon-based life would not be possible at all. That's could, you give, could, yeah, could you give an example of that? Well, the, the example is where does carbon come from? Mm. Carbon is made inside stars. It's the only place you can make carbon. And you get it inside stars by sticking three helium nuclei together to make carbon. It turns out that's a very, very difficult process to achieve. In fact, when people first began to think about it, they couldn't think how it could have happened. And then Fred Hoyle, who is a colleague of mine here in Cambridge, had a good idea. He saw that if there was a, a very strong enhancement effect in the trade we call it a resonance, occurring at a very precise energy, it would just be possible for carbon uh, to be made. Nobody knew that effect was there, but Fred said it must be there, and go and look for it. They went and looked for it, and they found it. Very great success. Now, that resonance, that effect, is where it is because the laws of nuclear physics are exactly what they are. If they were a little bit different, it would be somewhere else, different energy, and there would be no carbon and no carbon-based life, no mm. you and me. So that's an example of the fine-tuning of the world. And, and, and there are lots, of, lots and lots of examples of this, this kind. Uh, well, you can go on multiplying them in, in various ways. Now, the question is, is that just our luck? Is it just a happy accident? Can you say that God is behind all this? Well, you can't say that with absolute certainty, but it's a pretty reasonable view to take, I think. First of all, we can't treat it as just a happy accident. When Fred Hoyle discovered this, though he was very strongly inclined to atheism, 
he said, the universe is a put-up job. This can't be just a happy accident. There must be some intelligence, he preferred that word to God, behind it all. I remember uh, Freeman Dyson yes. saying that uh, it looks as if the cosmos knew we were coming. That's but right. It, isn't that rather a daring thing to say? Well, Freeman is a very honest, straightforward, and very, as mostly clever, clever person, and, and I think it's striking that he, he does feel empower, empowered to say that. Again, he's really saying, I suppose, what my friend Horrell said in, in more informal language, uh, this is a put-up job, this isn't something that is just brute fact and there's nothing more to say about it. There must mm -hmm. be some explanation lying mm -hmm. behind this. Mm -hmm. We um, have, uh, or you have quoted some famous scientists, uh, Freeman Dyson, Fred Hoyle, you, you yourself are one, um, who are very deeply involved in, in, in science, in science mm -hmm. on the uh, very academic level, right. and yet um, thinking seriously about religion. Right. That's something uh, surprising, isn't it? Well, I don't know why it should be surprising, because after all, scientists are people. And science, though it's wonderful and exciting and very successful, I have to say, in its own domain, its domain is very limited. It, it, it really does take a very narrow view of the world. If you ask a scientist, as a scientist, to tell you all that he or she can about music, they all say it's neural response mm -hmm. to vibrations in the air. And of course that's absolutely true. But it's not exactly the whole truth about music. There is a mysterious depth to music by mm -hmm. which these temporal waves of sound can produce uh, some mm -hmm. genuine encounter with an eternal reality. Mm -hmm. So the, the science is, it, is, a, is a very one-dimensional view of the world. Yes, but scientific world is known to be sometimes very hostile to the religious world. That if you do mm -hmm. science, you mm -hmm. cannot um, write something about religion, for instance. Well, that's, that's hostile because I think it thinks that religion is, is, is based on simply ancient authority, not a real pursuit for truth. It sees, for example, the encounter with scriptures as a foreclosing of the argument mm -hmm. rather than a resource for opening up the argument. And that, I think, is just a bad mistake. And it's a mistake that, of course, Religious people, the church and so on, over the centuries certainly has given plenty of excuse for people to make. I mean, I, I, I would be mm. repentant about that. But I, I think that, uh, that that's, that's the problem, that the people don't realize that religion is as truth-seeking an activity as science is. It's a different mm. sort of truth that it's looking for, mm. in my view, a more important, profound sort of truth. But it's, it's, it's truth-seeking. The question of truth is as, as important mm. to religion as it is the science. Are you saying that the scientific world should open up to religion in the sense that it should drop its ideas about an, an old-fashioned rel religious thought? Yes, I think, it, I, think, I think it should. I mean, people often uh, who write about these things, but there's a right from the scientific point of view, a very anti-religious, have a picture of religion of, which is, seems to be based possibly on a young child's experience in Sunday school, where things obviously are rather oversimplified. I mean, they don't take the trouble seriously to look at um, theological thinking and theological writing. And one of the things I'm trying to do in my own work is, I'm, trying, I'm really looking two ways. I'm trying to do two things, um, as well as the central thing of trying to find a bit of truth. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to persuade my uh, scientific friends that there are there is a scrupulous form an honest form of theological argument that they should be prepared to investigate and take seriously and I'm trying to persuade some of my religious friends that if they are seeking to serve the God of truth they should welcome truth from every source from which it comes including the truth that science can give us so I'm trying to look both ways and encourage the two mm -hmm. to take the other side seriously You quote a theologian in your book uh, who writes a book about creation mm. and never ever <laughs> mentioning once the relativity theory. Yes. You're well, not too happy about that, are you? Well, I'm not too happy. He's actually a great friend of mine and influenced me in, in, in my theological thinking. The trouble, the problem that theologians have is this. They're trying to speak about God. And God is the ground of everything that is. And therefore every form of honest human inquiry into the nature of what is, mm. is in some sense relevant to theology. Now, no theologian can know everything. And science is, looks 
difficult in some ways and technical, though some of its concepts are, I think, accessible to people who take the trouble. So if theologians can't know everything, what I would ask is that a few more theologians would devote a bit more time to taking science seriously. The participants in the science religion conversation at the moment mostly come from the science side. Most of us have a background initially in science. And it would be nice to have mm -hmm. a few more lifelong, lifetime theologians um, joining in the conversation with us. Mm -hmm. Now, creation and uh, creator. Yeah. If the universe is without beginning nor end, what place then for a creator? It's a famous question of Stephen Hawking. That's right, yes. And Stephen and I were, of course, colleagues in the same department in Cambridge for many years. How were you? Yes. Um, well, uh, that's, uh, Stephen was a very great person in all sorts of ways, but he really doesn't understand much about theology or philosophy. The doctrine of creation is not about how things began. It's not answering the question, who lit the blue touch paper of the Big Bang? It's about why things exist. Leibniz asked the great question, why is there something rather than nothing? So God is as much the creator today as God was 14 billion years ago when the universe as we know it appears to have come into being. So God is not there to start things off. God is there to hold things in being. And if the universe had had an infinite history, um, that would not have destroyed the doctrine of creation. It would have modified it in various ways, but it would not have destroyed it. It's just naive, theologically naive, to think that God is about getting things going and then just leaves it alone. Mm. But uh, theories like uh, the Big Bang, mm -hmm. uh, the Darwinian evolution theory, yeah. Aren't they opposed to what we read in the Bible in Genesis? Well, when we read the Bible, uh, we have to be careful we understand what we're reading. The Bible isn't a book, as people often say. It's a library. It has all sorts of different writings in it. It has poetry, it has prose, and so on. And if you read poetry as if it were prose, you'll make a lot of bad mistakes. You know, mm -hmm. Robert Burns says, my love is like a red, red rose. <laughs> you say, good heavens, his girlfriend has green leaves and prickles. That's a bad mistake. When you read Genesis 1 and 2, if you think it's a divinely dictated textbook given us by God to save us the trouble of doing science, you're making a bad mistake. You're, a lot of people think that. They do think that, and that saddens me. And I go to North America a lot, and I meet a lot of people there who think that, but they are actually, this is the irony of it, they are actually abusing the Bible. They're using it wrongly. Genesis 1 and 2 are theological writings, and their purpose is exactly to say that nothing exists except through the will of God. God said, let there be. So people who try and read the Bible that way are um, making a mistake. And that's why we need both religion and science. They, we need them to complement each other. When Darwin came along and produced the insight of the theory of evolution, mm -hmm. it's absolutely historically wrong to think that all the clergy shouted no, 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 all the scientists shouted yes, yes, yes. There were a lot of arguments on both sides. And some... Uh, Anglican clergymen in this country immediately saw the point of it. They said, uh, a gentleman called Charles Kingsley said this, that God could no doubt have snapped the divine fingers and brought into being a ready-made world, but God had done something cleverer than that. In bringing into being an evolving world, God had produced a creation in which creatures could make themselves. It's the gift of God. God brings into being a world with great uh, potential, great fruitfulness that can be there. That's what the fine-tuning is about. But God allows creatures to explore and bring to birth that fruitfulness in their own way. And that's the gift of the God who is the God of love and not the cosmic tyrant, not the God who has to pull every string in a sort of divine puppet theater. But then you bring in God again. And when I thought that Darwin said, um, we don't need a God to explain how this life came into being. We've got the survival of the fittest. We've got... Well, Darwin uh, didn't quite say that. What Darwin actually did say um, at the end, end of, of The Origin of Species was that there is greater majesty in the idea that God mm. breathed into what, a small number or perhaps one form of life, the potentiality for life, and then allowed that to develop. That's a little bit like what I've, what I've just been saying. Mm -hmm. uh, Darwin was... Not, certainly not an out -out atheist. I mean, he wasn't a Christian believer, uh, that's for sure. And that was partly due to the very sad death of his daughter Annie, yes. which rightly, rightly disturbed him. Mm. Um, but he, was, he didn't quite know what to think about religious matters. He was, I suppose, mm. an agnostic, but not, not an unsympathetic agnostic. Mm -hmm. But in uh, everyday language, 
Darwin is associated with the kind of belief I just mentioned, like we don't need a god anymore. Well, that's right. He, that, that, yes, it is. But that's because that's because um, some, I think, fairly unscrupulous um, atheist mm -hmm. propagandists, mm -hmm. who also happen to be evolutionary biologists, have, have propagated that. They have stepped. It's science is wonderful, but scientism, which is making science the answer to everything saying that the only form of knowledge there is is scientific knowledge, the only form of questions worth asking is scientific questions. That is entirely different, and in my view, totally wrong. And it's, it's only when you put it, people put it that way that, that, that they can make these outrageous claims. I suppose that, for me, belief in God means that there is a mind behind the order of the universe, a purpose beyond its unfolding history, one who is the ground of value, and fourthly, one who is the ground of hope. Because we know we're going to die, and if we're cosmologists, we know that eventually the universe mm -hmm. is going to die. Mm -hmm. But I believe there is a destiny beyond its death, and that's something that science itself can't tell us anything about. And if there is a destiny beyond death, either for us or for the universe, it depends, in my view, entirely on the faithfulness of God. So, that, and there is, I think, a deep-seated human intuition of hope that this life isn't the whole story, or sufficiently meaningful to be the whole story. So the fact that God is the ground of hope is a very important part of my thinking about God. Mm -hmm. where, where does it come from, your thinking well, it, about it, God? Well, it comes, it comes, a lot of it comes from allowing my mind to be, be formed by the bi biblical image of the God made only in Jesus Christ, the God faithful mm -hmm. to Israel in Israel's history, um, the God of steadfast love, which is the God of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. That's the sort of God that, uh, and, and, and a God also I feel that I encounter in worship and in obedience. I mean, it, it's all sort of, it's a sort of package deal in that sense, all these aspects of my life. It doesn't mean to say that, that one, the, God is unproblematically present to me. I mean, I, 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 some people are given an untroubled faith. I don't have an untroubled faith in that sense. Sometimes I feel Christianity is just too good to be true. <laughs> and maybe, maybe I'm that. But then I say to myself, okay, well, deny it. And I know I couldn't possibly do that. I have, that's the side I have to be on. This is where I have to sign up. So what, what makes Christianity too good to be true? Well, almost. because it does say that there is hope that there is a meaning and purpose to life, that despite all the strangeness and bitterness, I mean, we have to recognize that's there, of life in this world. I mean, I've had a pretty comfortable middle-class academic life, but even that's not untroubled, and many, many people have, of course, much more troubled and difficult lives. But nevertheless, that, 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 that there, there will be a fulfillment to it. That seems to be a very... If the world really does make sense, if the world really is a cosmos, not a chaos, if there really is a, something to it, then there must be a God behind it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Paul Kinghorn. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.